Welcome to the Giving Voice to Depression podcast. We're your co-hosts, Terry and Bridget. Each week, through intimate, candid conversations with guests, we explore the different perspectives on and experiences of depression. We keep it real because the illness is real. We keep it hopeful because there truly is hope in spite of what depression tells you. We're not experts or therapists. We're sisters and best friends who live with depression and have interviewed hundreds of others who do as well. By sharing personal experiences, we can all learn from each other that while depression convinces us that we're utterly alone, that our best days are in the past, and that we won't experience joy or hope again, those thoughts are symptoms, not truths. Hearing others shamelessly discuss their mental health journeys provides information, connection, and hope taking away some of depression's power. Hi, Terry. Happy fourth anniversary of our podcast. Hi, back, and thank you to you, too. In 2017, we started this, as you know, after my worst ever depression. And we were talking about what we could do to reach and reassure other people who were or are where I had just been, in that dark, empty, hopeless place that depression drags and then locks us. And in talking, we realized that was the answer to our question. Talking, sharing our and other people's stories of life with depression would let listeners know that lots of other people have had similar experiences with the illness. And yes, it is real. And it is unquestionably depleting and potentially deadly. And there are ways out of the darkness, warning signs that we can heed, mental health tools that we can implement, And that there is comfort and healing in knowing that while our experience is ours alone, the experience of depression is surprisingly common and remarkably similar. To make sure that the podcast we were about to produce was both responsible and actually helpful, we reached out to Dr. Patrick Corrigan, one of the world's leading researchers in the stigma of mental health challenges. We asked him what he's learned from all his research and what we needed to learn to best bring light into depression's darkness. And here is Dr. Patrick Corrigan from one of our earlier episodes, giving his voice to depression. According to his profile from Illinois Tech, where he's a distinguished professor of psychology, Corrigan is the principal investigator of the National Consortium for Stigma and Empowerment, a research center that for years has looked at the stigma of mental illness. It's a heavy-hitting group with other researchers from Yale, UPenn, Rutgers, Temple University, the University of Wisconsin, Illinois State University, and the University of Chicago. Corrigan says the team's research began with what he calls the naive belief that the way to fight stigma is to educate everyone that mental illness is a brain disease. And actually, the research pretty clearly says that makes stigma worse. Education really doesn't work, which is a big shock. That's uh, not just a cranky old professor saying it. It's really based (laughs) on meta-analyses and a lot of other studies. Um, What really leads to changing is face-to-face human interactions between people who are struggling with a condition and everybody else who, for, for lack of a better word, we'll call the public. Specifically, interactions which communicate recovery not just illness or struggles. You like to talk about on the way down story. So that is the challenges the person had with serious mental illness. Um, And on the way up stories, which is despite those challenges, people recover, they should have goals, they can achieve, they should be hopeful. And that's what the combining leads to the best message. Corrigan has freely shared his own mental health story in conferences and classes around the world, in hundreds of peer-reviewed articles, and more than a dozen books. He's also part of the team that developed the Honest Open Proud series of anti-stigma programs. And I just want to be able to share a part of who I am. I don't, I don't particularly want people to know so you can pity me or tell me how to get better. I just want people to know who the full Pat is. And so I've been hospitalized. Um, I took my meds this morning. I've struggled with alternately diagnosed with anxiety disorder, major depression, bipolar disorder. 
Um, it's had a pretty big challenge for me, but despite that, I'm able to get by and do okay in life. <laughs> and that's sort of that way down, way up story. I, so I go around the world presenting this program, and what I'm constantly amazed at is the number of people in the audience who say, I'm just sick and tired of having to keep it a secret. It's who I am, you know. I'm not bad, I'm not dirty, I didn't choose this. And so I think for a lot of people, the benefits of coming out is just being able to be authentic. For other ones, one of the other big ones for me personally is, you know, if I'm in a room with 100 people, 100 coworkers, statistically 20 of them have a serious mental illness, and yet I feel all alone. Exactly. I don't know who they are. And so if you take a risk and come out, perhaps two or three or four of those other 20 people will say, yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too has been our consistent experience as well. It seems any time someone speaks openly and shamelessly about their mental health, there's a shift in the people listening. They reactively feel permission or a sudden increased comfort or safety sharing their own stories. Maybe it's knowing they'll be heard. Understood, not judged. Um, I think stories, I think coming out does two things. One is um, the degree to which people consider for themselves whether they should be out uh, and tell their stories hugely tears down the shame people have. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the other thing is, and therefore the more people that are out, um, the more public statement will go away. A comparison that I'm somewhat comfortable making is looking at how we've changed stigma in the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. It's not because um, my children learned in health class that it's all genetic and hormonal and not having anything to do with choice. It's because by the time they got to health class, they knew they had a gay uncle, actually two gay uncles, um, gay minister, gay friends um it's the fact that people came out and i think it's the same thing with mental illness but don't make the mistake of thinking dr corrigan thinks it's a good or even safe idea for all of us to run out and tell our personal stories to anyone who'll listen so how much of a risk is there patrick in sharing our stories of depression anxiety bipolar disorder and suicide attempts um huge but worth it um, there are a lot of pros and cons, which you and I could probably identify and agree to. Um, but at the end of the day, it's the person making the decision who needs to weigh them for her or himself. Also, um, that decision's fluid. I mean, partly it changes depending on whether you're talking about coming out work versus your extended family versus mm -hmm. your child's play group. Right. Um, and it also changes over time. Our next question led to one of the most important lessons we've learned doing this podcast. We instinctively believed that sharing stories about life with depression would be helpful to people who hear them. But we didn't yet understand the value to the person sharing. I naively asked, so we and our guests share our personal experiences with depression in an effort to reduce stigma and increase understanding. But I don't get that there's any huge benefit to us putting our dirty laundry out there. And Corrigan made a paradigm-shifting distinction. Well, I think part of the thing is the story's not all dirty. That is a good point. I mean, there's a lot to my mental health struggles that have given me a different, perhaps more broader understanding of the world. I'm probably more likely to be empathic than your average male. I understand hardiness as a result. I understand empowerment as a result. So I think one of the things we try to encourage people, again, is it's not all just an issue of on the way down. It's definitely an issue of on the way up and forming a full person as a result. Another important distinction Corrigan shares is that society deals with the stigma of mental illness as a public health issue. He says instead it needs to be seen and fought as a social justice issue. For any other kind of ism, racism, homophobia, sexism, people that are harmed by the stigma are the ones that are leading 
the charge. Um, the problem with mental illness stigma is a lot of time it's been led by either good intended family members or professionals, not the people with mental illness themselves. So I think firstly, like any kind of empowering effort, which is what anti-stigma effort is, it's people with lived experience need to do it. And since that includes, well, all of us, we asked how to do that. Is the value in saying, be honest and share your story if and when that feels safe? Or do we suggest sharing these episodes with other people's stories so you can still start needed conversations, but there's less potential risk? I think you're either a person with the condition, in which case you should be taking the lead, and the lead is telling your story of recovery, or you're an ally, somebody who stands behind, stands with a person with the condition and says, I accept you, I respect you, I'm with you as you are. Um, I also think that for your listeners, coming out is not a light thing to do. It has lots of risks. Um, a Supreme Court judge once said it's hard to stop the clanging bell. Once you're out, it's very hard to go back. And so I would not say to people lightly, you know, tomorrow I'll go to work and let everybody at work know. Um, but if you've thought about it, consider the pros and cons, learn relatively safe ways to come out and decide to do it. The more you do it, the less shame you're going to feel and the more the rest of the world's going to figure out that people with mental illness are, are, are as competent, able, um, empowered as everybody else. Yum! I'm with you as you are. Who doesn't ache to hear that? Absolutely. I accept you. I respect you. I am with you as you are. I wrote that down, too, when I heard him say it. I loved it. Mm. And also the idea that we, you know, it certainly doesn't stop being a truth because we have any diagnosis, are competent, able, and empowered. That's a good trio to be. It is. Yeah. And I, we've talked so many times about the fact that the people we've interviewed, our guests on this podcast, are remarkably those three things. I am, you know, we continue to be amazed at, at the resilience involved in living with a mental health challenge. It's inspiring. It will always be a part of me. And now I know that that inner bully is, I don't hesitate to talk back to it anymore. And it's a warning sign to increase my self-care. And it's no longer a heavy secret that I have to carry and hide. In fact, it's the opposite. Now I find myself people and I can talk about it and ask for support when I need it. Bridget, I've never heard you say that, that you have learned to talk back to it. What does that mean? What do you say? Um, I think the podcast has taught me that my voice of depression is saying to me pretty much exactly what everybody else is, is telling them. So it immediately, I don't know, I... I, I, I uh, well, on a, on a good day or on a decent day, I can talk back to it by just saying, like, that's not true. Oh, good Shut for up, you. Shut up, you know. Good for you. I am good. I am. I'm wonderful. Doggone it. You are wonderful. Doggone it. And people like you. And people like me. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to, you know, just talk to you about it. And now here we are on, like, an international podcast talking about it. And that just straight up decharges the story. It absolutely does. And we've got to go back to the very beginning, which was, gosh, as we start our fifth year here, a long time ago, it feels like. It's a lot of interviews and a lot of weeks and a lot of, a lot of learning. And I really am still grateful to Dr. Patrick Corrigan because he gave us sort of the story arc for our every episode. You know, we have someone tell the story as he described it on the way down so that anybody listening realizes, oh, this person gets it, right? They've been there too or somewhere similar. And then the way up so that there's some recognition that there are ways out of the darkness and that there's hope. And if we can put that out into the world, that is a good day's work. It is. And I want to loop back to the last thing he said again, which is, I am with you as you are. Mm. And, you know, we in the Giving Voice to Depression world and on our podcast with Facebook, that's where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. We are stronger together. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Corrigan. Thank you, Bridget. We truly hope that our podcast brings a little more understanding, helps you better articulate your experience of depression, or better understand how to support someone else's. We invite you to join us for daily posts on the Giving Voice to Depression Facebook page and on Twitter and Instagram at Voice Depression. 
it is a comfort to be among fellow travelers on depression's dark road. And remember, if you're struggling, speak up. If someone else is, listen up.